All right, uh, Moreno Tato, it's nine o'clock, and time we were underway. <laughs> So there's the bells tolling. You guys right? Right? So, so um, the first item for today is number 13. Page 45 of your agenda. Governance, the budget for governance and support services. I welcome Mr Logie to the chair. And questions from councillors. Do we have any? Maybe, Mr Mayor, just while people get their, their thoughts around some questions, just a couple of things. Um, obviously this includes a lot of the support services uh, within Council, but it also includes the, the investment income. So it includes the investment income for the Waipori Fund and the costs associated with that, and it also includes the investment com income that comes from DCHL. If I just refer councillors to the FIS statement on page 51, just so we understand the, the capital expenditure within this group, um, you'll notice that the numbers have got brackets around them at the bottom of the page. So there's 4183 for a levels of service and existing assets 1489. So they are negative budgets. You may recall yesterday that we indicated that we'd put a $10 million timing adjustment in the budget. So that's where it's reflected at the moment. As we go through the refining of the capital program, we'll put that negative back into the, the, the individual groups. Other than that, we're happy to take questions. So a question for me regarding those figures and brackets. So because that's a, uh, a capital expenditure, so is that at this stage a capital saving? Correct. And <laughs> I'll remind all of us, including me just right then, uh, to, you only need to start your microphone, do not turn it off because the next person speaking will turn it off for you, which uh, Mr Logie kindly did for me but I still reach for the button. So, so don't, turn, don't worry about turning your microphone off, just turn it on when you want to speak, and that's all. And I'll leave mine on in case I need to call for a question. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, Mr Logie, page 47, uh, D, at the top of the page, the 29K increase in CSA around the after hours service. Can you talk us through that? Or perhaps somebody can talk us through that. Claire, is that something that you can answer? So the C additional costs in CSA for the after hours service? Uh, yes. um, the charges from um, Palmerston North City Council provide our after hours services and they reviewed their costs and charges and um, we haven't basically have, there's nothing we can do about that so we've actually had to take that. So uh, we were looking, if I recall correctly, we were looking at bringing that back in-house potentially. No? Um, okay. So there's nothing we can do about that. We have no options. Not a feasible option. I have a question on that for uh, Ms Austin. Uh, what is the percentage increase in CSA then? Because we know the various, our, our rates increases and our fees and charges increase. What is theirs? There's a um, I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Just on the contract, Mr Mayor? Yes. Maybe, Carolyn, if you just, just maybe indicate the increase in overall cost for CSA, and that'll give the councillors an idea. How about we come back? Overall, it's 21,000 increase. Um, yes, so it's um, percent, one percent increase. Yeah. So there were savings in, in personnel costs. <coughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, questions, councillors. Uh, Councillor Lucas. Um, 
On 10A, we were talking about the increase of budget of 354000 for the 10-year plan. So if you take out the audit fee of 145, so effectively it's costing us 209 to do the 10-year plan. And what... what? Correct. That's, that's just the cost of us bringing an extra resource to do the 10-year plan. Obviously, we, have, we only do it every three years. So obviously, we have to resource accordingly for that, for that development of that plan. Well, and further to that, well, then back in number six, we talk about um, increase in um, FTE. So there's a, uh, one FTE um, proposed there, specifically says for the 10-year plan um, for that. So then, so there's a one FTE, so that position, plus the 200. So we're talking like 300, close to 300,000 to develop the FTE for the long-term plan. So is that just a... That's just an additional cost for the coming year, and then that will drop off. Right. That, um, and I'm just, there's a lot of um, additional staff here, I, I guess, um, um, I guess in an overhead, I'm just kind of concerned about like a, a general creep, you know, one staff member here, one staff member there. Um, I don't know whether you can comment on, on exactly why we need to add so many extra staff. Oh, sorry, I'm happy to answer. It was covered, I think, in um, the staffing comments in the Chief Executive's report because this is about starting to put some people in the places that we need them where we haven't had them before and some of the... And so they happen to fall in this budget and if you look at the top, it covers, what is that, 10 different areas within the organisation that just under that. So we've got, for example, someone new in web because we try to improve how we deliver things online, but we needed a body for that. Um, <coughs> we've got um, additional needs in the civic space now with um, with additional committees and various other, other things in that area, trying to do some more stuff in-house and biz. And so they all fall here, but this is offset by some of those 85 vacancies, which have been our positions potentially in those same areas, which we're not filling. But it's still a one point, let's say, one point four million increase in staffing, in in corporate, in corporate. But corporate doesn't exist apart from um, in this budget document as a single entity. And the additional position for legal for Three Waters reform that's that's not funded from any of the funding we've had for Three Waters. Yeah, there's a corresponding funding from Three Waters for that already saved us money that position. Um, and just one last question, sorry. Um, the South Indian Futures project, that that's actually an increase, a bottom line increase for us of 50, are they fixed term positions? They're, they're fixed term positions for relatively short periods of time for specific projects. Council Vanderus. On the same issue, um, there have been some problems with Biz and uh, Web Team. Uh, and uh, I had understood that some of those issues were uh, outside contractors. Are some of these extra staff going to reduce our reliance on some of these outside contractors? Uh, through the chair, I'll take that, Councillor. Yes, um, Graham Riley is doing a really good job, I believe, in um, looking at our um, contract costs. And I, I can't remember which report it in, but one of our significant uh, computer biz contracts have reduced by about a quarter of a million dollars this year. Um, so he's doing a really good job at, at bringing some of that stuff back in the house and getting some of that stuff under control. So that explains some of the extra staff that we've got? Yes, sir. Yes, it does. I have no more questions. Uh, would someone like to move the report? Look, Councillor Mayhem seconded Councillor Houlihan. Would you like to speak to it? No need to speak for it, very good. Therefore, I shall uh, put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, carried. On to number 14. The annual plan Budget update for regulatory services. We have Ms Austin and Mr Logie again. Would you like to speak to the report? Take it as Raj. Mr Mayor. Uh, any questions? 
Councillor Benson Pope. Um, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. The, my question relates to the um, changes to the parking charges uh, or the parking configuration on street in George Street. Uh, and while I am entirely in support of the decisions that have been made, I'm puzzled by the and welcoming the 30 minutes free parking. I'm um, puzzled by the schedule on page 65 where it appears that there is no um, sanction for parking beyond the 30 minutes. Um, I may have the wrong part of the schedule, but on 65, the last section, uh, the second, the third entry line is parked in breach of a time limit and the, the LT the, and the legislation has the range of fines. We currently charge nothing and there are no changes proposed. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. I'll have to check on that. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And maybe just just for clarification purposes, we, these the, the, the change to the parking, particularly in that thirty minute zone, is not is a recommendation from us. It's, it's obviously still a decision for council as to whether they want to do that. The the thirty minute zone runs from London Street through to the exchange. So obviously, the, with the reconfiguration of the streetscape north of the octagon, the, the metres have been removed anyway. So therefore, you obviously you can't charge. It's where the council wants to then extend that from for the for the south through to the exchange. Thank you. My my question was about the uh, the incentivisation of following the 30-minute um, allowance free. And you'll come back to us on that. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just want to ask a question on page 54 at the top. The $190,000 reduction in building services reflects a reduction in chargeable hours due to mandatory training for building inspectors. Can you please explain what the mandatory training is? Um, so I as part of our accreditation, so um, as you will be aware, Building Services is a building control authority. Part of the um, meeting accreditation standards that those inspectors, building inspectors, have to attend that mandatory turnit, uh, training. So what we've done in terms of forecasting, predict our revenue, we've taken into account that there's going to be downtime because they're having to attend. So um, that's basically the net result of them having to attend that training. So because they're training for the building inspections that then we charge for, are we able to charge more for the building inspections to, to make up that, that, that gap? We we look at the, the total cost, so you'll see that there actually is a proposed increase of uh, $10, um, but um, we tend to look at the, the whole picture rather than um, look at the whole service. Yep. We, I said we also need to be conscious of the impact on, on the sector, which is also under a lot of constraint at the moment. Councillor Gilbert. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I got a couple of, uh, I have, sorry, not I got, I have a couple of questions uh, around page 65, specifically around e-scooters. If I am reading this correctly, per annum, uh, Neuron or Lime or whoever we want to call it is paying $500 in total for all of the scooters around town if, in terms of administration. Is that correct? Um, not quite correct. Um, it's got that that net fee, but then they also pay um, 13 cents per ride. Correct, but the administration in here says uh, $500. But is is that in line? Of, uh, is what we are charging uh, the e-scooter companies in line with elsewhere. It seems to me that that is, um, how do I put this tactfully, 
a significantly smaller figure than I would imagine uh, we perhaps could be or should be. We're actually um, charging in, in the median range. Um, we looked at light councils, um, and the range was between 11 cents and um, 15 cents per ride. We're charging 13. And the administration fee, because as I understand it, other councils are charging around the five sort of five thousand dollar mark. Um, the the administration fee is minimal. The mid administration overheads are minimal for that. But are we in line with other councils? We're in line with with what we are what we're charging in terms of. Um, what's reasonable costs in terms of our overheads and in terms of our fee per ride, we are in that median range. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Um, yep, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the report. Um, an AP process would not give, be completed without a discussion around parking. Um, I actually largely support the changes here. I think making it simpler to the outer inner is, is really logical. But I'm just my question is around um, our longer term goals around mode shift and the signals we've given around that, and particularly around the all day parking costs. Although I'm supportive of this now, is there a longer term view to make those all day parking costs at a level that um, give an incentive, stroke encouragement for people to mode shift, or is that is that really down to us as councillors to to propose that. Oh. How dare you do that? <laughs> That's usually me. So, so there is a piece of work which is the parking management strategy, if you remember, and that's the longer term piece of work that will take account of all of this in a more strategic way. So in terms of answering my question, that's the process we need to feed into to, to expedite those desires that some of us may have or otherwise. <laughs> got you, got you, sorry. I shall use my on button for my microphone uh, and call upon, uh, you've finished your questions, Councillor Walker, so Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it, my question relates to the Great King Street car park and, and consistency with the Meridian and objectives in George Street. I can't, it looks like the Great King Street car park um, is free on weekends and public holidays, but it doesn't have any free parking period at the start. Is that correct on what I'm looking at? As opposed to the Meridian giving you free parking for a few. So I would suggest that the Meridian provides free parking because it has ex it has the retailers that are associated with that. We don't have any income coming from the retailers associated with that our building. So that's sort of the reason why they do it. But certainly as we do the parking management strategy, we need to look at do we want to do stuff like that? How much lease parking do we want to have in the central city versus casual parking? Because that's certainly a challenge for us as we do have a lot of lease parking in the central city, which may need to be reconsidered in terms of providing that casual parking. So from a perspective position, obviously you've given us the answer of a revenue perspective. I'm thinking from a traffic management perspective and the ideal of trying to m reduce the traffic on George Street, would we consider going forward the role of a parking building to aggregate parks into that area rather than going up and down George Street? So again, the parking management strategy will start informing some of those decisions. So. Do we have to wait for the parking management strategy to have an opinion on whether or not the first 30 minutes of Great King Street car park should be free, given that we are still setting the budget on this? Um, I guess is the question I would ask. Is it of us or is it of you? On-street parking is a delegation of council fees for that. The off-street car parks um, are free for... It's a delegation of the chief executive. But you are still free to... You know, to to make those changes, but generally, um, as officers, we would look and see what the other things are happening in the market and adjust off street um, in accordance with any of the other buildings. Very good. Uh, Councillor Gary. 
Thank you. Uh, page 61, a couple of things on page 61 at the right at the bottom of the first section, um, marquees for community and not-for-profit organisations. I see that that's gone from zero to $400, and I wondered uh, what the thinking was behind that. Um, currently, well, up until now, the situation has been that it's a variable um, and full standard fee based on time. So, in fact, this is actually a low fixed fee. So, um, quite often, um, the chief executive may receive requests to waive a fees. Um, and sometimes those can be quite significant for not for profit, they can be up to 2,000. But it's hard to forecast in terms of um, demand. So, um, the, this is proposed that we actually set a low fixed fee for community groups. Thank you for that explanation because it looked like zero to 400, so that's helpful. And then further down, uh, just wondering what the approach was around sort of halfway down on the third section, failing to comply with the notice regarding work to be carried out on a dangerous or insanitary building. I guess I was surprised it was as low as $1,000. And uh, in terms of um, uh, incentivising people to meet those requirements, um, I wondered what the thoughts were there. Sorry. Um, just, just looking at that, if you notice there's um, a section reference in that. So um, some of the regulatory fees are set by legislation. I can check on that one, but um, I see the section reference, so therefore, I mean, but I can follow that up. No, that's fine, thank you, and I hadn't noticed that, so thank you for that explanation. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Across um, these budgets, are there many um, double-digit increases besides in the car parking area? No, um, the majority of the regulatory fees are actually remaining the same with nil increases. So where we look at the outer all-day parking at 42.9% uh, and up to 40% in the off-street parking leases, there are anomalies in relation to the rest of the budgets. And Mr Logie, are there any across you know, the other parts of council where we're looking at 40% increases? So the challenge is that parking operations for, for, it just happens to fall into this group from a 10-year plan po point of view. In terms of the, the level of increases, the dollar values are quite modest and we're trying to make sure that the, that the lease parking is not out of kilter with the all-day parking casual. So, and, and predominantly it's the, I think it's the Thomas Burns and, and those two car parks around that railway station that we're proposing those increases. But again, if, if council want to, they can they can change those, but we think the increases are quite modest in relation to the fact that people get access to all day parking. Thank you. We appear to have exhausted questions. Thank you very much. Now, uh, would someone like to move the motion? Councillor Houlihan, second to Councillor Vandivis, would you like to speak to it, Councillor? No. No. Uh, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will just touch on parking, which may hope in a flood of talk sometimes. Um, it is appropriate to set your parking levels desired to get an outcome you're looking for in your transport system. However, at the moment, in terms of mass transit and dealing with the requirements of the commute, we don't have all those components in place at the moment. So I imagine that. The parking strategy will have to wait until those stuff get put in place. I raised the Great King Street car park free parking at the start because while we may have a different business attitude to that building than the Meridian does to there, I'm looking at it from the driver's perspective and the transport outcomes we would be looking for if we want to get drivers to not target just the Meridian for that free car parking and disperse the cars around a bit more. So I'd like us to consider offering some free moment at the front of that for the purpose of our traffic management rather than as opposed to from the perspective of um, income generation. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, I, I acknowledge the paper and um, I'll be supporting it, but 
I am frustrated to see the increase in the lease parking fees increasing by so much, um, especially ahead of the parking management plan that will be coming to council. Um, and also noting the um, out of zone all day parking. I think the part that I am focused on is actually having these uh, lease parking fees at what they were or even a slight increase but not a 40% increase or a 42.9% increase I think is out of line with the process that we've been going through all the way through. The other part is with my economic development hat on is that we actually want the workers working in town and leasing these car parks um, and essentially spending money around the city zone. If some, uh, we've had enough issues with COVID and not all workers coming back and working five days a week in the centre city. And if the increased costs of the off-street lease parking turn some workers away from saying, actually, I'm, I'm going to try and work from home three days a week and instead of work in town five days a week, then I'm deeply concerned. Um, we can't just keep putting these rates up by, we can't put up these rates this much when we also have a parking plan coming. And... It's not all about modal shift. People do drive their cars for a purpose, and I think that's important to note. So I do find it very frustrating to see, to be honest, parking hit so hard in this, pa in this paper. Oh, <laughs> OK. Councillor Walker, then. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but I'll just, um, I guess, responding to the previous speaker. I mean, I'm, I guess I come from the other side. Um, and as Mr. Logie says, the percentages do seem high, but the actual, the actual dollar number is relatively low. Um, I've always thought, and I do agree with Councillor O'Malley, actually, this is, and, and actually to a certain extent, <coughs> Councillor Wiley, that a lot of this can be addressed in the, um, the, the, the soon to arrive, hopefully, parking management <coughs> plan. Um, but I, I'm often, as many of you know, and you're sick of hearing, I spend a lot of time on my bike. And when I'm sitting at traffic lights, I, I play a game of counting uh, one-person car drivers, and it's staggeringly high in this city. Uh, mo a vast majority of cars driving around didn't even have one person in them. And the, the simple reason is it's really easy to drive in Dunedin. It just isn't replicated in other cities in the world where they have a far more robust system. That's where I agree with Councillor Mary Malley. We don't quite have the bits of the jigsaw together yet where if, if we do have a, pu a push-pull incentive system to encourage more people onto mode shift, a lot of that extra mode isn't there yet. It's coming. And credit to the OSC, the bus system is getting better. Um, and I've, something, I've, I've been accessing that a lot more as well. But... Um, we got to remember parking parking for seven bucks all day rising to eight bucks all day is absolutely no incentive to encourage anybody to do anything else it's really cheap it's cheap in new zealand terms it's definitely cheap in international terms and we've got to face reality and it's not about it's not about brutalizing or, or or attacking the driver i've said around this table many times again and i'll say it again i will be the biggest defender of those people who need or want to drive i just think we have to little work a little bit harder in providing the incentives for those who can to do other things and i don't think uh, the, the, the actual dollar increases here are going to be in any way detrimental to business. Ain't going to stop one person in their one one person in their car um, driving because of these changes. Um, and I applaud them. I just wish they were they were higher. But I'm prepared to wait until the management plan comes along. Thank you. So um, I'll make a uh, comment myself and. Um, on the issue, and I think that convenience and reliability is the key to public transport, and we need to do what we can to make our public transport system in Dunedin as convenient and as reliable as possible for our part in that, which is a relatively minor part compared to the OSC. Nevertheless, there are things we can do. Uh, but similarly, uh, especially along uh, George Street and the areas just off George Street, it's going to be very difficult to get to, uh, especially in the as the next two blocks are redeveloped. So. I think it would be very helpful if we could have more casual parking available off street. Uh, I don't know that we have any in Falil Street, but certainly in Great King Street we have some. So to make that more convenient for shoppers to use, and I think uh, support uh, Councillor O'Malley's idea, that we have 30 minutes free for a start, and that will just you know, help decongest uh, the inner city a little bit. Thank you. Councillor Benson-Pope. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to um, <coughs> support Councillor Walker's <coughs> support Councillor Walker's comments and 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 remind colleagues of um, the research that was done by expert traffic consultants, MR Cagney. Um, some of us have read the report. I hope everyone will have by the time we get to uh, discussing the issues that Councillor O'Malley was alluding to and Councillor Walker was referring to because the facts of parking supply in Dunedin are unequivocal and they're described in that parking roadmap, which is on the website for anyone watching who wants to um, search it. Uh, and that report puts to bed a lot of the myth that's been developed by some members of the community and some members of this council about parking supply and the reality of par on-street parking and off-street parking in Dunedin. <laughs> All right, at that stage, at this stage, uh, I'll put the motion. You can see on the screen behind. Nope, I think everyone's had, uh, yes, everyone's, we've exhausted commentary. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. The next item on the agenda is 18. I think that's where we got to yesterday. In the consecutive, yes, so economic development. And Mr Christie is coming to the stand. Uh, would you like to speak to the report? Uh, Kira, good morning. I'm just happy to take questions, Mr Mayor. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Question on page 102 about the there's $500,000 in the capital funding budget to replace existing assets, is that the eyesight? Uh, yes, that's correct, Councillor. We are looking at doing a refresh and a rebrand for eyesight. It's happening nationally, and our component of that is being met with a 50% subsidy from uh, from MB. So that amount is the full expected cost, but there will be some reimbursement for that as well. So is that in line, I notice there's, is it $283,000 revenue, is that, in that li is that in that line there? No, the additional eyesight revenues, because we're starting to see increased visitor activity, and we'd expect that we will be able to draw additional commissions in the next financial year. So with the eyesight, um, I know there's been an, a national look at it, but have we looked locally about how we deliver information to the visitor, given that we're moving into more of a, a digital world, um, and perhaps the model of eyesight might be a little old? Have we actually looked at how we're delivering information and whether investing in a, in a set place is a good idea? Yes, yeah, so we're waiting to see what the national um, eyesight um, board are going to recommend in that regard, but we are constantly looking at how we're delivering that service to make sure that we're meeting the needs of um, the local community and those that are visiting and using that service. A substantial component of that is obviously the uplift we're seeing again with crews. Um, we do provide um, services at port as well as in, in the Octagon site. Uh, we constantly review that with our cruise action plan to ensure that we're meeting those needs for each of the seasons that we um, we come across. So we, we'll do a debrief on this season as well to make sure that we capture any potential improvements that can be made for the next season. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, on page 101, I note there's a $50,000 increase in grants and subsidies. Can you just explain what that relates to, please? I think the grants and subsidies is one where we're receiving some additional funding. Um, I'd have to double check that though, Councillor, but I think that's in relation to um, some additional work that we've got with um, code. Uh, Councillor Gary. Uh, just a brief question on page uh, 98, and it talks about the personnel costs. Um, 
ha has the staffing fully returned to uh, what is needed for the return of visitors? I, I see it's staffing returning. Are we fully staffed currently? And, and therefore, are the personnel costs going to increase further? Yeah, we have an interesting mix with particularly um, cruise season requiring additional seasonal workers. Uh, so we are seeing an increase in that activity this current financial year. We are expecting that the next financial year will see us back to full visitor numbers and hence the staffing um, requirements are going to be back to where they were uh, pre-pandemic. And uh, has it been? Have we managed to recruit fairly easily? Uh, because we do, you know, we do have recruitment issues in other parts. But how has it been in that particular area? Uh, we've been delighted with our recruitment into the eyesight this season. Uh, we're looking at how we can retain those fixed-term contract workers that we have for the season uh, with other alternative employment across um, the organisation, uh, perhaps working with FIFA so that we can get them to return back for the next season, which is, believe it or not, that, not that far away. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Gilbert. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question around uh, fees and, and things. Do we at the moment, and I probably should know the answer to this question, do we do foreign exchange? No, we don't. Have we considered it, given, as I understand it, most banks have now stopped as well, so our foreign visitors who come off the boat with American money often turn up to, for example, a bakery stall at the farmer's market wanting to buy things and are unable to unless that person were to offer them a one-to-one -one exchange? Yeah, I know EyeSight staff previously have facilitated that through the banks. Uh, it is something that we could look at as part of any future improvements of that service, but um, it, it brings with it some complex issues, I guess, around ensuring that we've got the appropriate security. So it would require a little bit of work for us to be able to look at whether or not we could feasibly do that. And I would suggest that it's probably not something that we should be getting into, and Mr Logie's going to agree with me, I think. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to be careful around the, the legislation, around being, becoming a, potentially a financial institution, and the complexities and, and legislative requirements that would come with that. I'm not sure whether now then would be the, the time to raise it, but it would be quite interesting then if that is not the, the option that we choose to go down from an um, economic development point of view, we seem to be limiting uh, our international spend if our international visitors can't get our currency, so it might be interesting to find other avenues or other options or, or something. We'd probably just continue to work with the banks in the first instance to ensure that, that at least there are facilities available for our visitors. Following on from that, what sort of advocating have we done with the, you know, because normally when you go overseas, there's bureau to change everywhere, and you can go to a wee booth and they change your money. It's it's quite, you know, very common. Um, but that is a good point that Councillor Gilbert's raised because I haven't seen any around here. Do we, because uh, it would be good to have some when they're all milling around the octagon and if they have only got their American or whatever dollars they've got, um, it's difficult for them to spend. Right. So I'd suggest that there's a cash exchange in the Meridian and that our eyesight team probably directs anyone who wants to exchange physical money there, which is pretty handy. What sort of advocating do we do to, you know, try to encourage more of that? Well, we haven't done any today, Councillor. Is, is it possible we could look at doing some? Um, I think what we would be best to think about is how we can ensure that the appropriate information is getting to visitors around where there are sites that they can exchange that money. Um, so the banks and obviously the Meridian are sites that we can make um, known to our visitors. Yeah, I think I read an article the other day and I think Councillor Gilbert raised it too. Some of the banks aren't even holding different cash now, I think, is the case. So are we? is that a concern for us? And if it is... What are we planning to do about it? I think we'll just continue to work with those current providers and I'll 
ask the ISOIT staff if they've discovered any um, impediments to that particular process, but my understanding is it hasn't been raised as an issue by current staff and there are facilities available in the city that we can direct them to. So you feel there's enough facilities in the city right now, is that the case? Or? I don't know if I can answer that, um, Councillor. I, th I think there's, there's always a, an element of um, you know the market needing to meet the needs of the services that they provide. So we would leave that to the commercial sector to undertake if they thought there was an opportunity there. Councillor Vincent Pope. Thank you, Mr. Is it not the case, Mr. Christie, that? Um, ATMs d distribute cash in the local currency? Uh, that's my understanding, yes, Councillor. Not actually an issue? I don't believe it is an issue and certainly hasn't been raised by staff. OK, at this point, uh, we have exhausted questions. Thank you very much, Mr Christie. Uh, Councillor Wiley has indicated he wishes to move, seconded by Councillor Gary. So I'll put the motion. Joy, would you like to speak to it? Yes. Um, just briefly, um, the two points I would take on was one, the issue um, commentary from Deputy Mayor Barker about the eyesight and the vision for what a new eyesight or modern eyesight looks like, especially with the way that people now travel uh, and how that works in, in relation to the budget uh, and how we go forward with that area. Um, I didn't think we'd go down foreign exchange route today, but um, I guess the one comment I have made make about it, uh, the advantage of Dunedin being the last port of call is actually um, quite important because the amount of times I've seen uh, cruise ship visitors running around town trying to spend the last of their New Zealand money before they hop on the shuttle to basically get on the cruise ship to head off to Australia uh, is always a plus and I know um, quite often they donate some of that money as well. So um, there is some advantages at times for um, currency exchange. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I was asking questions about the eyesight because we are working on our destination plan at the moment and we also need to, to move into the modern era with how we are delivering information for visitors. We spend 1.5 or invest $1.4 million operating costs into the eyesight every year, of which about $500,000 uh, comes comes back as income and there's a, a, a joint venture there with DOC but I absolutely believe that we need to look at how we're providing that information and when it comes to information we're talking about foreign exchange I was involved um, working for council many years ago in the cruise action plan and we actually worked to do to make sure that we were educating the um, the retailers about the accepting foreign currency, etc. I know down at the market people will be bringing their cash in the one to one ratio, but it, it, it is difficult when people turn up with cash, and I think we do need to have a look at that that issue because we want to be the best host that we can be and see if we can follow up what the demand is and and how we can be um, amazing hosts. Councillor Gary. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just wanted to comment uh, on the aspect of personnel uh, and uh, just comment that it's good to see our staffing levels up, uh, the return of our international visitors, uh, and I was delighted to hear that we're going to keep, we're going to try and retain that institutional knowledge and redeploy staff uh, across the FIFA event. Um, the more um, experience and knowledge our people have, uh, year on year, the better hosts we can be uh, contributing to that manaakitanga uh, that Dunedin is known for. Uh, right of reply, Councillor Wiley, no? So in that case, I'll put the motion. As you see on the uh, screen behind, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item number 19, which is the Waste Management Budget Update. Mr Henderson and Mr Drew to the Chair. Any comments? Any? 
No, Mr Mayor, uh, happy to take the report as read, happy to take questions. Are there any questions? Yes, Councillor Melly. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, welcome. Uh, point eight on page 105, um, increase in operation and maintenance cost. Um, you note the increase uh, of the ETS charges of 117,000. Can you tell me what the total ETS charges are now for the landfill, <coughs> roughly? Uh, it's actually a variable figure depending on, because we get audited every year on our um, uh, ETS. There's a, there's a, there's a factor for, to be accounted for in the actual amount of methane that gets destroyed by the gas system. Um, approximate figure would be about two and a half million dollars. Thanks. Um, and you're saying basically if we destroy it um, and convert it to CO2, we, it comes down because of the gas, gas catching and gen generating plant? Yes, correct. And the, uh, the more we destroy, uh, the bigger the, for a better word, the discount is. Do we, when we take up the new curbside collection and we m remove organics from the from going into the landfill, will that come? Presumably, that will come as a positive towards us in the ETS calculations. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Over time, obviously, the amount of organics in the landfill up to that point um, continues to be accounted for. But going forward, it will the amount of methane produced will decrease naturally. Um, the, but the calculation is done then effectively on what they think is in the ground based on the methane that they can detect. Is that how it's done? Uh, no, it's actually the ETS figure is calculated on the basically the types of waste that have been accepted at the landfill and it also has a historical component to it. Um, so it's, uh, as I say, the types of the, the amount of tonnage of each type of waste that is counted under the ETS scheme um, plus a allowance for what has previously already been placed in the landfill depending on the type of waste. Um, and then that would be, the historic number would also then be um, discounted against the amount of methane collection and destruction by electricity production, I assume is how that goes. So if I'm getting this right, there's a historic number which is slowly but surely quite literally decaying and going down and then there is a number where, where the waste audits are showing what we're putting into the landfill and that's paid for in real time or is that also decayed down? I am going somewhere with this by the way. <laughs> uh, I, it's paid at one year in arrears but close enough to real time, yes. At what point will the 2.5 million start being really knocked back down in ETSs? And I guess my question there is it goes to our waste futures and our investment in, in organic um, diversion. If we are paying $2.5 million a year in, in ETS charges because of organics hitting the landfill, do we apply that as a savings against um, diversions for green waste? Presumably because if, if the Ministry of Environment agrees that we have diverted it away, we could eventually target that number down to zero except for the historic number. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it, it's probably more complicated than that, but yes. Um, in theory, yes, we could. Basically, the, after the first year of organic diversion, we would then be able eligible to apply for a, slight, uh, for a decrease in the ETS charges in the following year, so it would be year two after we bring in the diversion, and that would definitely start decreasing the amount of ETS that is paid, yes. Um, and then be up to council whether that's then applied as a against the charges. Not applied against the charges. It goes into our business scheme and whether or not if we're putting two point five million dollars out there in a charge to the government because of ETSs and we applied it over here and got and it diverted enough organics out that that turned or started to approach zero, then two point five million dollars application would be a neutral application of funds, is my point. Um, I'm looking at also the charges for curbside collection. Are we paying f increased charges for the existing curbside collection or is this for the new curbside collection which hasn't rolled out yet? Uh, the existing targeted rate will continue as is for the moment, but the costs are, uh, for the contract in the first year are uh, increasing due to the increased levels of service that we're bringing in, um, in on 1st July this year. I heard, because we haven't really had it come to INSCOM yet in, in greater detail, that we didn't have the trucks to do that in the 1st of July. Is that true or not? 
the additional trucks for the likes of the organics collection and waste collection won't arrive until much later this year or possibly early in 24. Um, the contractor is going to bring in uh, some additional level of service this year, basically borrowing trucks from other parts of the country. Uh, and this charge then reflects the partial execution of the curbside collection contract. Thank you. Um, and now point 15, um, going back to something that I thought we'd talked about before in the past and it had been resolved differently, which is that the um, waste disposal levy has been applied to material used for daily cover at Green Line Landfill. Starting, just my starting question on that is, um, we need that material for daily operational running of the landfill, do we not? Yes, we do, yes. Therefore, is it really waste or is it actually material required for the daily running of the landfill? The way the Ministry for the Environment have decided to, op uh, to run the scheme is that we have to play waste levy when it comes in the gate and then as we use it for as cover material, we can then try and claim that back. Uh, as a yeah a, a positive against what we've already paid, and do we pay that back to the person who brought it through the gate for us? <laughs> and yeah, that's where the current scheme becomes quite difficult to administer. But we uh, we have to report three monthly on the stockpile that we have of cover material that we use to cover the waste, and if we haven't used that material within that three months, then we, we don't get the levy back if we can prove we've used some of it. So it's basically just a complicated accounting question uh, and inventory management. Are we building up a waste, uh, are we building up a significant stockpile of this material and not using it? Uh, the thing is that the, the material that comes in, we're trying, we're, we've stopped doing it now, but yes, that was the way we operated so that we always had material on hand because uh, the construction industry where we get the cover material from, the, the clean dirt, is seasonal. So we'd basically stock up in summer to use over winter, etc. Uh, we're trying, we're having to avoid doing that now and trying to manage those levels as low as possible. My question was, are we building up a stockpile like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as opposed to does it have seasonal variation or at the end of a 12 month period have we effectively use it as an operational activity in the landfill? Um, yeah, hopefully I'll be answering your question that we obviously the landfill operator needs to try and estimate how much material they're going to need uh, as cover material over the course of maybe three months and uh, yeah try build a stockpile so that they can use and always have material available. The What we don't want to end up in is a position where we don't have any cover material and we actually have to start buying soil in order to cover the waste. Um, so there is a stockpile but we're trying to manage that stockpile on a uh, as required or just in time basis. I guess where I'm going is it appears that we are using all of this material in the landfill as an operational activity to, do, to make the landfill work correctly. And if we're not, then we would be building up a big pile of material somewhere that year on year would be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if that's not happening, would you agree then that we are probably using it all? And it's, this is an argument really that I'm hoping will go all the way back to the Ministry of Environment, but we obviously have to start it here. Are we, build, are we establishing a stockpile that year on year is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, or generally over the course of a year or even two years, that stockpile goes up and down but it more or less maintains its site and it has to have obviously a certain amount on hand for the demands at the time and reflect the seasonal variation of what's coming in, but over the course of an extended period of time, one year or two years, is it more or less at steady state and effectively over that two year period being used up? Yep, correct, yes. Can we then get back to the Ministry of Environment and ask them the logic of charging a waste levy for an operational activity? Uh, that was our argument the first time around. Um, to be honest with you, Councillor, we didn't get anywhere the first time and I would find it sl probably slightly pointless to try again. I don't really agree on that pointlessness, so I guess we'll just have to wait for speeches. Mr. Mayor, can I just clarify? So that just so the ETS cost budgeted for next year is actually 3.6 million, and actually the, the last financial year we spent 
because we had a higher tonnage but, and, and a higher UEF rate. Our UEF rate is coming down, but obviously the price that we have to buy, and we, we have to buy the credits on the open market. We don't, we don't pay the government. We actually go out and buy them on the spot market. So the, we're budgeting at $90.35 next year for the spot market price. Just subsequent to that question, so if we've got the same, we're, got, we're paying for, we're paying and rec receiving credits from the government for that that cover material, that should be in balance. If the if the stockpile is in balance in a steady state, then the money going to and from the government should be in a steady state. Is that the case or not? Yeah, with if we manage the stockpile or the. Uh yeah, the stockpile of, for daily cover use. If we're managing that correctly, then yes, we sh uh, if we use it within the three-month period, and then that's an ongoing, a rolling stockpile, then yes, uh, that should cancel each other out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, coming back to the question about the um, expanded street curbside collection, um, I, I've had a couple of... It's, it's that time of year where people are renewing their private contracts for a whatever service they might have that's not ours. Um, and I've had a couple of queries about the start date of our expansion. Mr Drew has kindly provided me with the um, 1st of July date next year. Are you confident you're going to hit that date in terms of the trucks you were talking about, the, the contractor and the bins all being here and so on? I'm as confident as I can be in the fact that the reason we delayed bringing in those additional services this year was to allow the contractor sufficient time to ensure that it's all ready to go next year. How confident can you be? <laughs> I think Mr Henderson has answered that. He said he's as confident as he can be. Uh, is that the end of your questions, Councillor Bitsbuck? Well, see, I'm not going to get an answer here. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Now, I'm not sure whether this was what Councillor O'Malley was getting at, but um, it's come up before, and I think, is there, because it's correct to say that landfills, is this correct that they get incentives for having more Waste is that under the system? It's sort of a funny setup. Is that what happens? To it. Uh, sorry, councillor, are you referring to contracts with operators or the ETS and the refund back? That when you get money back, isn't there a system where? Can you just explain that for? Because I know it's come up before. Where if you've got a certain amount of waste, you get they. It's almost incentive. I remember hearing another time and thinking this is ridiculous because it almost incentivises <coughs> waste. If you see what I mean, because the government was giving you know money back for certain amounts of. Uh, I may not have fully understood that, but. Uh, no, no, the system is basically a uh, cost per tonne for the ETS scheme and the waste levy. It's basically a cost per tonne, so the more, uh, or, or, or cost per tonne or cost per carbon emissions, the more waste you receive, the more you pay. Where the incentive is, is in having uh, good gas extraction systems and control systems, and that allows you to then discount how much you pay if you can prove that you have captured uh, the gas and destroyed it that then allows you to discount against the amount of waste levy you're paying. Uh, sorry, amount of ETS that you are paying. Right. So if you have a larger amount of waste, you get more gas. Would that be correct to say? Yes, but you'd also be paying more on your ETS charges. Right, right. And so the two of them would wipe each other out? Yes, yes. Okay. Councillor Walker? Yeah, thank you. Uh, probably a question for our numbers guru, uh, Mr. Logie. Um, what's the current um, ETS spot price for r just r roughly? Uh, sorry, I don't have the current. We've based it on future projections at the $90.35. H hence the question. I'm just wondering how it's tracked. Uh, it's, it's fair to say it's going up. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So each year it's going up. So our, our saviour has been our, our tonnage and, and our UEF factor that's meaning that we can manage some of that cost. But certainly, I, th I can't recall what we, well, we're about to pay. I, I'll let you know when I pay the next bill, which will be in March. <laughs> And um, I guess, obviously, with the current um, direction from the government, and it probably wouldn't change if the government changed, is that that charge is likely to track up, isn't it? Correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, Councillor Melly has indicated a, a question. Yes. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have questions around the waste disposal levy, which I think Councillor Holyham was possibly referring to earlier. So where does this sit in the budget? I see that it's going up. Is it from $30 to $50, or am I correct there or incorrect? Yes, 1st of July 23, it goes from $30 to $50 per tonne. So I believe that we pay out some money and then we get some money back for waste disposal activities. What sort of percentage do we get back? Uh, it's a... Once again, it's a relatively complicated um, calculation because it's not just based on waste received into need and it's all waste around. So it's approximately 50% of the levy that we receive back each year, of the waste disposal levy. And what do we do with that levy? I'm aware there's some, some grants, but what, what is done with the rest of the levy? Uh, that pays for our waste education program, it pays for the grant scheme and predominantly it pays for half my staff and the, in the, uh, the, the staff that are involved in education and promotions. Councillor Hulet. Dear Asset, but is there some irony in the money that you get from waste being paid for people to promote reducing waste? Uh, yeah, I guess you could see an irony there. Um, probably the other side of that coin would be that it's a good use of the money to actually try and promote reducing waste to landfill. And if you do too good a job, you don't get the money. <laughs> Is it really the intention of both the ETS and the WDL, those two levies, that in fact that money is used to effectively cause diversion and you're using it so the is my take that the waste disposal levy 50 percent is coming back to the to the collector but the other 50 percent goes back to activities in the ministry for environment again for reduction of waste so it's a levy taken off for the purpose of reducing waste volumes yes correct the what doesn't get returned is approximately 50 percent is retained by the government and they use that in granting for nationwide or large projects Another question, Councillor? Thank you. Is there any way, other way, it could be funded where it's not, because that's what I was trying to say before, but I probably didn't say it that well, but where it incentivises waste? You know, is there any way that, can we think of a way, I mean, maybe if we proposed a different model of funding, that may be what Councillor O'Malley might be going to do. But it just seems to me... Um, you know, to to give 50%, that we get 50% back from our waste. So the more waste you get, the more money you get back. It's It just seems if there was another method of funding that and, re and rewarding it for, you know, having less waste would make more sense. I don't know if, if we've considered, well, obviously I'm sure we've considered that, but... Um, is it possible to think of a model we could is it possible to maybe even propose a model to them that would be more in line with reducing waste uh the, yeah the um the best way of achieving achieving that is actually true uh and it's pretty much out of our power really the the further up the waste hierarchy you go, the better it is to actually impact on the waste stream. So we, what we really need is for less waste to be produced at the start. So it's not addressing things at ambulance at the bottom of the cliff by trying to reduce waste and when it's already been produced from going to landfill. Uh, it's probably not best use of time. The best use of time is actually trying to re prevent that waste from being produced at the start and that really is the role of central government itself to achieve that uh, and that waste disposal levy that they're using is aimed at doing doing pretty much that and some of the bans that they've brought in for plastic bags and that kind of stuff is actually there's been some movement in trying to adjust that 
address that waste being produced right at the start. Councillor Gary. Uh, thank you. I wasn't going to speak, but feel the need. Um, Mr Henderson, uh, I take your point about uh, reducing waste at the start uh, by not producing it in the first place. Uh, but given we do use money for education and grants, uh, can you um, tell us if you are seeing uh, progress in that education and the difference that the grants are making in terms of taking the community with, along with us on the journey of reducing waste? Um, yeah, behaviour change is a long, slow road. What I can say is that we do get, uh, we do do surveys to people that have completed the either the composting courses or the um, living waste free courses those kind of things we do do follow-up surveys with those people um, and we get good results in the people that have actually modified their behavior going forward based on that education um, but when i'm saying that of course we're only talking maybe three each type of event we'll only be doing three or four a year with maybe up to 20 people in, in each one um, so it's a long, slow process, but the other, um, obviously the more people we reach, uh, the more uh, impact it has and the more that it impacts on their, their circles, uh, their social circles, etc. So, um, yeah, the feedback we receive in the surveys, etc., is that we are seeing positive change. Um, and the impact of the grants? Yeah, the impact of the grants, we do a, one, after 12 months we get the feedback from those, we uh, have a report back system to actually um, confirm that the grant money achieved the result that was intended. So yes, we get um, the figures back from that to tell us that the, the X number of tonnes or material or whatever has been diverted from landfill. And finally, would it be true to say there's been some exciting initiatives come out of that grant scheme? Uh, yeah, it's getting better all the time. As, as more attention is focused in, in, this, in the waste space, uh, in the last few years we have seen some quite, quite exciting stuff actually start to come through. Thank you. Thank you for the report and your work. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I just want to go back to the, the waste disposal levy because I see that it's going to, our expenditure on it's going to go up 450 something thousand. And, and, and if we're getting 50% back, then we will get approximately $228,000 back. So I wonder how is the policy set for how the waste disposal levy is invested by council? Is that a staff decision or is it a council decision? Uh, any money spent? in regards to the waste disposal levy has to be in accordance with our WMMP. So it has to be spent on the initiatives that are, uh, that are laid out in the WMMP and it has to be spent on um, infrastructure and it has to be spent, um, I'm just trying to remember there's a third factor which has just completely gone out of my head, I apologise councillor. Um, but yeah, there are the Waste Minimisation Act specifies exactly how we're allowed to spend the levy. And how do we decide on the percentages? Because we've I also sit on the grant subcommittee, and we've had a lot of community groups which are doing amazing work, um, and we can't fund them all, I guess. And I was just wondering how it is that a decision would be made to put more money into the waste disposal grants, waste minimisation grants. Uh, that is a decision of the appropriately delegated. Committee, which I believe is ISCOM, um, could actually make a decision uh, to our staff to investigate increasing the levels or, and, or changing the split of the grants. Councillor Hulan. Thank you. You mentioned there's some amazing initiatives. Can you name some of them? Uh, well, uh, one of the best ones that came in uh, just recently, of course, is I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's related to alcohol, but uh, a lot of a lot of waste bread is now being used. Bread that was wasted and going to landfill as organic waste is now being used in the in, the, uh, in gin. Um, so it's that, that sort of thing, and they're actually doing very well. So those kind of um, quite exciting reusing it again and giving it a, a second life rather than just being complete waste to landfill is uh, yeah very much to be encouraged. Yes, and it's, I mean, through that, there could be quite a start-up cluster coming from those ideas, is that, which is quite exciting. Thank you. 
Great. I, I have a question about the sludge uh, from Tahuna. Uh, what is the state of play with the burner there? Sorry, with the, the incinerator? Yes. Um, so the incinerator is operating, is that? Oh, can you, you well, we're still paying um, 843,000 to ourselves for, uh, the, I suppose, the surplus sludge that the incinerator probably that the incinerator can't handle that still has to go to Green Island. Is that the case? Uh, yeah, correct. So there's about 20 tonnes of wet sludge produced per day and the incinerator has capacity for about 15. So do we have options for increasing the capacity of that incinerator? Uh, so the team are considering many options for sludge disposal, not just increasing the capacity of incinerator, but um, beneficial reuse of sludge as opposed to destruction or um, disposal at landfill. And so that work is ongoing. There's no conclusion from that work yet. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fiso. Tēnākoe, Mr Mayor. Tēnākoe, um, I'm just asking about um, expenditure on page 105 and point seven under, under personnel costs. I see there's a decrease. But um, given the, the work that we have to do in the city and to in partner with um, community organisations and small to medium enterprises, um, is, would, could there be a case for, I know it's, you've got a very small team, could there be a case for actually looking to increase personnel and so that that work urgently can be done, especially in um, diversion? Uh, that that um, personnel, the, the, the decrease in personnel costs there actually relates to um, what's going... Uh, what am I trying to say? The, the project around rolling out the new curbside services, there were personnel assigned to that as fixed term employees, but we weren't able to recruit anyone suitable. Um, so we've disestablished two positions, and actually, there's now contractors filling those roles uh, because we were unable to actually recruit. Um, the focus predominantly of the whole team at this point in time is the new curbside services and the new resource recovery park. Um, yeah, so. I, 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 it would, uh, there is always a case for um, more can be done, but then um, the simple fact is at the moment, as I say, my team is very much focused on new curbside services, and that's uh, very, uh, that's the focus of our activities right now. Just to, just to follow up on, on um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to drive at is that I'm aware of, and as you will be, of course, that the um, soft plastics recycling um, scheme has ground to a halt because of the lack of a baler and lack of personnel to operate a baler and to... Um, to and so uh, I, I have been having some conversations with, um, with community members uh, who are frustrated at the maybe the um, inability of our not not I'm not blaming the city council staff. I'm just saying that there's so many levers that uh, can't be pulled so that people are you know storing storing soft plastics until the baler comes back or they're having to send um, soft plastic away in, 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 in envelopes. So I, I'm just um, trying to express some frustration at community level where there's community organisations or smaller enterprises that um, are not feeling supported to actually drive this further. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about growing the in-house team to, to actually support that and resource our communities. So I can speak to that one, Council. I know that the team have been working with the private sector um, yeah, and there's a substantial amount of effort that has gone into um, working with the private sector. But I guess uh, for that particular example, other than Council taking a role, 
uh, that is normally filled by the private sector, it's really challenging. I have a further question. The interest cost has gone up really dramatically. It would possibly indicate a, a, a leased plant or something like that. Why has it gone up so much? Uh, the increase in interest cost is related to the capital spend, which is related to the new curbside services and the resource recovery park. So the uh, increase in, in capital spending to begin construction of that plant and to buy uh, the likes of curbside, new curbside bins, etc. Thank you. Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, has there been any further work done on looking at um, collecting organic waste from businesses? I know that's not covered in the new curbside um, contracts. Uh, no specific work. The recent well, it's not not recent anymore. Uh, last year, Ministry of the Environment obviously consulted on making food diversion compulsory from businesses. Uh, we haven't actually seen the results of that yet. Um, so at the moment, uh, basically leaving that to the commercial sector at the moment. The small premises that, are, that can actually take advantage of our curbside services, we do actually offer curbside services to small businesses and schools and that kind of thing where it's appropriate to do so, where, the, where it meets their needs. Um, but we don't do large-scale uh, commercial activities at all. I guess, I mean, for a lot of businesses, they were um, utilising the um, composting service that was um, at the back of Logan Park, and that's no longer operational. So, I mean, it's, I know it is an issue for many businesses not being able to, you know, send their waste to compost. Yeah, obviously, the, um, when the composting facility is, where our own composting oper operation is um, up and running, for our curbside services, that will be available for, for drop off, commercial drop off as well. Further question, Councillor? Um, commercial drop off when we come with a charge. Because I really am going back to that group that was behind Logan Park who were running on a very much uh, worth of an oily rag um, and yet were servicing at their height or over 30 companies in the centre of the city. So would they be able to drop it off at no charge? Because that's what they were doing in their own facility. Uh, I'd put that as highly unlikely. Uh, there will be a, there's a charge, there's, there's a, an operational cost that comes with a composting facility and that needs to come from somewhere. Alrighty, we appear to have covered all questions. So at this stage, uh, Councillor Malley has indicated he would like to move and provides a amended motion, an amended motion. Seconded, Councillor Fiso. So, please speak to it, Councillor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would just speak to the amendment C straight away, um, and then I'll get on to my main speech. The amendment, the third amendment really is simply it, it makes no operational sense and, and it cannot be in the spirit of the waste disposal levy to be charging a waste disposal levy to a material that is actually required for the normal operational function of the landfill. And I really, really, really challenge the logic of the Ministry of Environment that they have applied this levy in this way. And I will give another statement and that is I am frustrated sometimes at the logic that comes out of that ministry when it comes to good environmental outcomes. And so I will be, once the staff have written, I will be expecting a reply to explain the underlying logic as to why this material gets the levy and in the way in which it's applied. To the item itself, um, I, the waste disposal levy itself, um, its intention is to reduce the amount of material going to a landfill by making it less appealing to use the landfill and effectively encourage people to go to diversion. Obviously though there are some stuffs that cannot be diverted and then you're going to apply that levy. But it is really there to people who are not bothering and are, and are basically therefore not diverting properly before they use the landfill. Um, that then should be used by, half it then goes back to the territorial authority that administers those landfills. and. I think my feeling right now is that we have used this almost exclusively for educational purposes. And I think you, while you can achieve some stuff through that point, you have to ask how many composting classes can you put when you're dealing with tons and tons and tons of organic material coming your way. 
and I'm looking at organisations like One Coast up on the north coast in Waikawaiti who are an active diversion activity and yet really are not getting much in the way of this kind of funding and sources. Our waste minimisation management plan has in it a requirement to develop local capacity. Yet we are putting money into a new material resource facility or a MRF um, and yet we'll have that stuff bailed up, sorted out and then no local industries to process it. So we need to start being more ambitious in our approach to environmental solutions. And I would not necessarily direct this to the team, but I do direct it to the council in general. Are we going to take this more seriously? The question I asked around the ETS is, when, when before they rose, they were around about $1 million a year. As Mr Logie points out now, they're coming to 3.6. They will continue to rise. They will go to 4, eventually 5 million. We should be using that ETS charge as a calculation against our diversion. The questions I asked Mr Henderson was, how do you get that ETS charge down to zero? Well, you'd get it down to zero by showing the Ministry for Environment that you're not putting anything organic in your landfill anymore. How do you do that? Well, you can't do it through too many classes. You have to start putting in facilities that are going to actually do it. How do you achieve good outcomes in your community when a company that was going around servicing the local commercial entities in town, when our own team said we couldn't service them, would then end up being charged a charge to bring that material to the, to the, to the, to the organic processing plant? We've got to get more sophisticated on how we approach this. We can't keep looking at all the problems that stop us working. We've got to work out how to make it happen. And what I'm really saying is, at $3.6 million a year on ETS charges, straight away, we should, have an, we should have a budget over there which is matching that, which is about getting that number down to zero. Because if we spend the money over here and get that number to zero, it is a zero-sum game. And we achieve the environmental outcomes we're looking for. So. I guess my feedback really is I want this team beefed up and I want it to actually achieve what we said we we're going to achieve. Our zero carbon emissions target, this is a big part of it. We talk about a zero waste target and yet we, I don't think we are truly embracing it to the level we need to. Um, so part C really is just again going after some of the logic that we're having to deal with. Because a lot of this is coming from central government. A lot of the stuff that's happening is good speak, but then a logical application of what they're trying to say. So that's part of it. But then I think we need to look internally as well and ask ourselves, are we actually getting the outcomes that we want? Um, and I'll hand this over because I think there's plenty more people want to speak to this item. Uh, yeah, look, I'm quite concerned about this um, part C because I don't think... Uh, it's addressing all of those issues that you've talked about and it's not helping us with what we, um, and I'd say most people around the room would like to be doing, is reducing that levy and reducing the amount of um, material we put in landfill and in particular the organics. <coughs> you know, you're asking a very specific question of the Ministry of Environment, and it, which is why the waste disposal level is applied to material used in the operation. But we've just heard from Mr Henderson that we are paid back whatever is used. So we levy it as it comes in and paid back what is used. So it, to me, it's in balance for that material that's used as cover. And to me, the ministry has uh, not granted an exemption because it's far easier from their point of view for accounting to levy everything that goes there and refund everything that's used as cover material. So my understanding, what uh, Mr Henderson said, is that anything used as ma material, cover material, is refunded on a one-to-one -one basis. Therefore, you know, from their point of view, it's a good practice because otherwise, you could have councils or you know various uh, op landfill operators saying all of this is used in the operation of the landfill. Therefore, we don't have to pay a waste disposal levy. So it's far simpler to charge the levy on everything going in, and everything that's used as material. Can, uh, cover material can be refunded. And, and that, that seems reasonably straightforward, and I think you'll just get the same answer back from them. And I think we should be having a, a slightly different motion here, and I'm not sure what it is because you covered a lot of topics in your um, opening um, uh, speech to the motion, uh, and there are a lot of useful things in there for covering... Um, 
for things that we should be doing, for instance, you know, we, uh, we could have plastic recycling going on, we should be having that active diversion of the organic material in particular, and um, you know, the, the better that we can get refunded for that, uh, the very much better off we will be, and also uh, so much less methane will be produced by the landfill. So uh, I'd suggest, that, well, I haven't, <laughs> I don't know that I'll be able to uh, come up with a, an amendment that will cover more broadly what you want to achieve, but I don't think this will uh, achieve um, what you're seeking to uh, what you're seeking to do. However, I'll leave that to you to come back. Deputy Mayor Barker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I speak weekly, if not daily, with people who are really passionate about waste minimisation and who want to hold us as council to account, both businesses, people who live in the community, our community groups. So I support this. I add do support a C. I think that this is, we talk all the time about centralised bureaucracy and this just seems to be to me another example of in and out accounting and it seems a little ridiculous. So I think that writing the letter is a good idea. We absolutely need to be more ambitious with our waste minimisation. I have asked questions for how long have I been here? Three years about a waste minimisation plan and what are we achieving? I think we had 16 to 18 measures and some of them including um, Working with businesses, I've asked that question and I have not been happy with the answers. So we absolutely need to focus. I'm really pleased that we have had clarity that we can go through ISCOM to decide how to use the waste disposal levy. We'll have an extra $200,000 in that. And I think we absolutely need to focus on what we're using that for. I'm privileged to sit on the um, grant subcommittee and I really would like to see more money into the grants because we need to empower our community to also do recycling. So some of the startups have been um, community or community groups have been doing recycler device, the Dunedin Curtain Bank Trust, one Coast Wakawaiti, which is often mentioned as a, a stellar performer, the Malcam Trust, the South Dunedin Festival, and then there was also a, an eco laundry for reusable nappies. So the, 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 the ideas are out there in the community, which is great. Um, soon we'll be reopening the Dunedin Bowling Club, which is addressing food waste. Taste Nature, which uh, is the again, again reuse service. Looney Maternity Hire, which is about um, basically recycling maternity clothes and helping people out there. Uh, someone's looking at doing live sign, reusable real estate signs, which is addressing some of the core flute issues. <coughs> Holy Cow with their milk dispensing machine, of course, which is taking a huge number of plastic um, bottles out of the system. Dunedin Craft Distiller, which reduces bread to landfill. Waiwai Permaculture, which is looking to get a machine for compostable string tying machine for tying up the vegetables. And there's also, this sounds like an ad for the grants, but we have small grants for $500 and quite a number of schools have been getting worm farms for their schools. Um, there's Food Waste Hacks event, which is about getting ideas for saving waste. Um, a joy to junk event by the Lions Club of Port Chalmers. So when I'm reading out that list, that's just a small part of all of the people that are applying for grants and putting those into their community, into businesses, and thus we're empowering the community to look at waste um, minimisations. And I think we all need to think about where is that waste disposal levy, which is a huge chunk of money, coming back in and where is it best placed. So I look forward to the, um, the ISCOM meeting where we're able to discuss the policy and the waste minimisation plan which I'm very passionate about um, in future and I, and I do support A, B and C. I think we do need to be talking to the Ministry of Environment a little bit more clearly about the, the give and the take and all of the, the extra bureaucracy that's involved in that. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you Mr Mayor and <laughs> thank you for the passion round, round the table and as often happens at these annual plan budget um, meetings, we morph f f away above and beyond what we're actually doing here, which is the recommendation to approve the draft budget for Waste Management Group and approve the, the fees and charges. Um, and and you know, obviously see there, I have no problem with Councillor Marley putting that forward. I, I admire his passion. Um, the response from Mr Henderson is probably correct, but ain't, ain't no harm in trying. So I'm happy, happy to support, support this. Um, and since we are moving above and beyond the recommendations, um, I'll just uh, I'll just add my 
uh, 10 cents worth as well. And I think it's important to remember the words of Mr. Henderson. I think he's correct, actually, that we need to look to government to, to take a lead on this. Um, I, amongst many others around this table, have taken individual uh, measures to try and reduce my waste, and so is the council, and I think that should be applauded. But I think to get that, that big change, we need to take, uh, look to the government to take a, a lead at the legislative level. And, and that's part of the reason why we are transitioning. Uh, the government has forced uh, councils to transition to make the curbside con uh, collection uh, standardised across the country and probably 20 years too late. Um, and hopefully soon, we're soon to see uh, the start of a container return scheme, sort of back to the future. Uh, go figure, eh? Um, and, I mean, the government does have, it, I, I think it has a, a paper, I was looking through while everyone was talking, it has a paper out called Transitioning to a Low Emission Circular Economy. So I think it's incum incumbent on us as a council, um, and this is where we can make a, dif di a difference, to pressure the government to do the things within that document it says it wants to do, and some of them are uh, keep setting the direction for, for waste reduction, investment in, and that's important, in waste reduction initiatives and infrastructure. The second part of that really is important. We do need local infrastructure to be able to deal with the waste that is produced locally. Um, making system level change, obviously very important, and addressing pro pro uh, problems with individual products and materials. And it actually has started, it started well along those lines. I mean, it is, again, Mr. Henderson was correct in pointing out, it, it takes time to make change. Uh, we've now gotten rid of plastic straws. Uh, we've gotten rid of those bloody annoying plastic things that go on bread. Um, and the takeaway containers, that's been legislated, so it's changed. And of course, we're transitioning away from hard to recycle plastics. And that's all because the government has forced people to do it the same way it forced supermarkets to not produce plastic bags to supermarkets had a hue and cry at the end of their businesses. Have you seen the profits they're making this year? Extraordinary. Um, so, and, you know, and I think the most important one for me is, 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 and it applies to many sectors of what we do, is strengthening compliance and monitoring and enforcement. So let's, as a council, be aware that there are vehicles we can use already, and let's make sure, as a council, we put pressure on central government, whatever its colour, to do what it says it promises to do. Thank you. Councillor Helene. Thank you. Got to be quick with these. To get <laughs> too quick, you lose it. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank Councillor O'Malley for putting this motion um, and his passion, because he is very passionate about it. I have also mentioned numerous times and got quite excited about it, But and it's good to hear the story about the gin, um, but... Um, I think more of that could be happening around the startup sector. I think there's so many opportunities in the startup sector around this waste elimination and creating business opportunities for it. We did a wee while ago um, have a startup. Uh, weekend, I think it was around waste. That was quite a while ago. I would love to see us do that again. I actually think if we're taking this really seriously, and um, Councillor Walker touched on some of this too, as a council, I think there's a lot more we could do. We get this money that, um, as Councillor O'Malley said, you know, we spend it on education, and how he questioned how much education we can do for this without it actually, you know, is it making a huge difference? And I agree with him. What I'm wondering is, just just a bit of an out there proposal. We've got a campaign at the moment to help save the hospital. Why not, because we're an ambitious council around our 2030 carbon zero goal, why don't we have a campaign to highlight and reward businesses that are are picking up that campaign and supporting the carbon zero, i.e. like bus backs, ads in the paper, spread off so across social media and use some of that money that we get from this fund, from the waste, to highlight and name businesses that are doing really well with it. We could also name and shame the ones that aren't and say support the ones that are. And we need to make a difference to our environment. Look at what's happening in Hawke's Bay and in the North Island, other areas, that is climate change related. And it's directly affected to a lot of these things. 
and I think we have a startup sector that could be supported more, could be given some more money to focus solely on waste elimination. We've got, um, and we could have a really good campaign around the support and shop with businesses that are doing their bit. Why can't we do that? Let's consider it. Councillor Gilbert. Uh, thank you. Uh, Pete and Isaac, uh, the people who used to run Doubt Not Compost, which is being talked about, the people who used to, in fact, come round to the businesses to collect from the businesses to take away and do things with. And they did so not just because it was what they liked doing and what they wanted to do, but they were also able to uh, fund themselves. So for us to be talking about putting in place hurdles for businesses to try and do what we have been doing for a law, what they have been doing for a long time, and wanting to do uh, seems counterintuitive to me. Uh, putting pressure on the government to take the lead, sure, uh, but my belief is that we shouldn't actually be waiting to be told to do something, we should be leading the charge. Uh, we should be putting in and pushing the progress that so many residents and businesses are pleading for, as they have been for so long. Watching cities, communities and countries uh, around the world moving further, faster and seemingly with more active willingness behind their words is more than a little frustrating. Uh, so I will be uh, supporting this and uh, there is so much more that we can do as a city as speakers have been uh, touching on. And part of C to me, whilst does it cover everything? No, it does not. But is it putting, starting to put pressure on the government and is it starting to actually call out and, and starting to bring attention to it? Yes, it is. So that's why I'll be supporting this. Councillor Gary. Thank you. I certainly will be supporting the motion and uh, I just want to touch on the disconnect uh, at times between central government and on the ground and we heard about that in terms of the levy uh, to some extent. I've been privileged to witness the innovative uh, initiatives that have come to Grant Subcommittee over the last three years in particular uh, and prior to that. I can't recall how long um, the waste grants have been, the waste minimisation grants have been there, but certainly in the last three years uh, we've seen some extraordinary initiatives uh, and individuals uh, who have applied for those grants. Um, there is a real desire in our community to minimise waste, and this is one channel that we have seen this come through. Uh, I believe our community are uh, feeling frustrated that our curbside collection, our new curbside collection, is not able to be rolled out even when it was proposed for this year. I understand why it's delayed, <clears throat> but um, I believe our community is, is particularly frustrated uh, about the delay uh, and further delays to uh, roll that out. Because they've been telling us for a long time that we want to see organic collections, we want to get rid of the black bags, um, and so that is money well spent by us and wise decisions previously on that. One of the problems we have is that as in um, areas we've talked about before, all the components um, for a truly effective waste minimisation system, uh, we have not got all those components coming together just yet. But the elements are there. We need to continue strong advocacy to central government. Uh, we've got our local initiatives occurring. Um, our recovery facilities are going to be a really important part of that and that can't be done uh, immediately but it's something we're starting to roll out. There is still some work to do there. Um, not all of it is on us, some of the private sector has been uh, mentioned. Um, and I, I, I want to say that I believe at grassroots our families, our school children, our residents, um, let's not dismiss that education out of hand because uh, take, we often talk about taking our community with us. 
And in this particular case, <clears throat> we've got to ensure that there is behaviour change and the only way to do that for some is to educate our community. And I have seen that uh, firsthand with the way that Enviro schools, for, for example, work and that the, the effect that children have going home to their parents who may not be inclined <laughs> to um, recycle. Those behaviours have changed over time and I believe children have a, an incredible effect on that. So let's not dismiss that out of hand. Uh, I think what we're talking about is a, a balancing, maybe a rebalancing of how we use the funding. Um, so all the elements uh, um, are coming together. We don't have them all at the moment, but we're on, our, on a journey uh, and we all want it to be quicker. Um, but I'm very happy to support uh, the motion as it stands. Councillor May. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll be supporting this motion and I'd just like to draw attention to some of the work that um, our organisation Keep Dunedin Beautiful does. It sits within the council and we do a lot of waste minimisation work. Our national litter audit programme, um, our student regular clean-ups at the moment we have um, a tent at Tent City encouraging students, the university students, to be involved in our events that we do throughout the city. Um, we do collaborative work with our cup, our one cup and single cup use, uh, resource, uh, resuma, res, what's it? Resourcing. Yes, Resourcem, uh, Senorita Resourcem in her waste minimisation initiatives as well. I'd like to acknowledge the work that our team at Aviro Schools does. Um, and also every year with our uh, award ceremony, we are acknowledging and supporting the good behaviour uh, that's being modelled by businesses across the city. Um, just touching on what Carmen was suggesting, I'd like to say that Keep Dunedin Beautiful is supporting those local businesses to do better and perhaps um, a funding grant for Keep to Need and Beautiful would uh, assist with the good work that we do. Thank you. Uh, very good. You'll write a reply, Councillor Mellick. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I do acknowledge that this is a budget item and we've strayed quite a way away from the item. Um, <laughs> but to some extent, that's a function of the fact that the committee where this should have been coming to, INSCOM, has not had an opportunity to talk about waste involvement and solutions for a long time. Um, we just had an INSCOM meeting and we didn't get any activity reports from any of the departments. So for some councillors, they have yet to receive what those departments in INSCOM are doing. And it would be at least five months since the last one. So I think that this is spilled out into this meeting and I do hope that it's spotted by the staff that the desire for the council laws, the elected members of this, of this, of this entity, to see greater and stronger activity in this area came out today in the form of the speeches is slightly off piste. Um, to Mr Mayor's comment about Part C, uh, I was not intending to change the whole outcome of the Ministry of Environment and our relationship with government as an entirety. In fact, I was picking up on something which clearly shows the lack of logic going in behind some of these decisions. And I would ask the legality of us collecting a fee when Mr Henderson knows that we will not be able to give it back to the person who brought it across the gate. So we're going to collect the fee, go to the government, ask for it back and take it. I can't wait to see what's going to happen when people find that one out. So I don't think this has any way been thought through all the way through. So we would need to get an answer. Have you thought this all the way through? And to your point that councils might start stockpiling this stuff or putting it in their own landfill, how many Class A landfills are there in the South Island? You know, less than five, I think, probably. Um, and I'm sure that if one of them started doing it, they'd spot it. So I don't really think that that is a particularly real counter concern. Um, to Councillor Gary's point, I'm not dismissing education outright. I completely agree that it has a very important role to play here. It's a matter of whether or not we can keep going back and saying, well, we're doing education, therefore we've done everything we can. I think it's time to widen our scope. And back to this being in a budget item, we should be able to see in the budget and in fact, you cannot ask for any activity unless you see it in the budget that it's been financed. So one of our challenges is always to backpick through that budget and, demonst and can see in it a budget item that shows that the outcome we're looking for is actually financed and, and sitting there. And what I would say, my, my feedback is 
This team does a good job based on its size, and because of its size, it gets completely consumed by big activities such as the curbside pickup. But that means if it's doing that, it's not big enough to actually give effect to the waste minimisation and management plan, which is a statutory organ a thing that we must fill out every four years. It's a we're obliged to write it and then execute it. And the components of developing local capacity have not been, in my opinion, executed as well as they could have been. And that's where I'm really saying from a budget perspective, I'm kind of inclined to think that this is an underfunded part of the council and I believe that the people of the city would expect more funding to go into it. And I look at things like the ETSs and say, if we don't address them, we're quite literally actually mugging Peter to pay Paul because we're not dealing with, we're not dealing with the costs coming towards us. The government's hitting with these costs because they're wanting behavioural changes. And yet, so we've got to meet them with our behavioural changes. So that is a budget item. Um, so happy to go forward with this budget. Obviously, this means that this discussion will be working its way through to the long-term plan. And part C is not to change the whole of government, but quite literally to get them to ask about their logic over how they make decisions. Thank you. Very good. Um, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. And at this stage, we'll have uh, a 10 minute break, because five minute breaks don't seem to work. Seconded uh, Councillor Walker and uh, have a uh, chance to stretch your legs and, Bye. Uh, Bye. and come back at uh, 5 to 11, please.
Right, if we please resume our seats. So, rating method. We have Mr. Logie and Ms. Ellen. Yes. Do you wish to speak to the report? No. Are there any questions? Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, could you just um, just talk us through the um, significant increase in the um, lifestyle um, rate, please? So that's a reflection of the valuations that were done effective from the 1st of July 22 which will come into fruition in terms of rating from the 23-24 year. So, and further to that, so because predominantly they, they get the general rate, which is a rate in the dollar, rather than any um, fixed charges, that has a bigger impact on them because most of them don't have any service charges. I mean, they may have recycling, that might be, but they don't have you know water and other things. So that effectively hits them higher because of the rate in the dollar. Thank you. But uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Thanks for the report. Um, as we all know, the community services targeted rate is for the botanical gardens and some parts of parks and rats. What are the some parts? Um, it's, it's not specified in detail to what part of parks, it's more that this is the amount of revenue we generate from having the rate set at that amount. So in, a, in essence, once the, the botanic gardens costs were covered and there was any residual, it could just be, okay, yeah, okay. Councillor Eklund. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just getting back to the the example, at least, of the, the, the lifestyle um, uh, increases. Uh, obviously, there's a differential of its own that sits there as well. Um, when was the last time that that differential was looked at? So generally, council would look at the differentials as part of the long-term plan, and that's where that discussion would occur. And you, you mentioned that if somebody's rates have gone up quite significantly, they can challenge that. On, on what grounds can they do that? No, just, just so we're clear, what I said they can do is challenge the valuation that's attached to the property. And so the valuations that we're talking about here are strictly the, you know, the, the, the ones that have just come through recently. So they're what they used to be called GV or, or whatever. Correct. So there is an objection process. So just so we're clear, the valuations are done by quotable value. They're not done by council staff. So quotable value are our contractor that does that, and they are subject to audit. What is the differential for um, the lifestyle versus rural? And, and it's probably in the report here somewhere, but I've, I can't quite put my finger on it. I can see commercial, but I can't see... Um, um, so they're on page 121. So the lifestyle, sort of in the middle of the page there. The, so if they're up by factor. So residential's a factor of one, then lifestyle is 0.95. Great, thanks. Councillor Vanivis. I've come up against this issue for uh, many years now. We had a history where for a while the commercial differential was so much higher than any other in a uh, city in the South Island uh, that we pegged it back a bit um, over a period of years. But it's still right up there at 2.45 times the residential rate. What is the, uh, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, council decision to set these um, uh, differentials but 
Is there a staff uh, reasoning or justification for um, hitting commercial at 2.45 times the rate of residential for similar services? So, Councillor, as you said, the decision, it is a decision of Council in terms of the differentials. The question then is, <clears throat> is there a process by which um, this Council could get a um, report uh, from staff to uh, give uh, Councillors some idea of the effects of having a much higher differential compared to, say, Christchurch and Invercargill. Uh, is it possible for us to get a report which would um, perhaps explain <clears throat> some of the business flight to other centres and whether the rates differential is uh, going to contribute to that? Uh through the chair, the council is free to request staff to provide um, any report that it directs us to do. But being able to make that um, that would be a f about flight due to rates costs would be a very difficult report to provide. Um, we could provide a report on rating commercial rating differentials or how other properties are rated in various other authorities. What you could then interpret from that, I think, would be very difficult for staff to provide advice on. So what you're saying in effect is, uh, if, if I can just uh, paraphrase, is that there's no real way that this council uh, can effectively look at this largest commercial differential um, to do anything about it? No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I was saying is we can provide you with a report if directed on what the commercial rating differentials might be in other authorities, what we probably can't do is provide advice on what impact that has on what you called business flight, which was the second part of your question. Okay, thank you very much for that. The, uh, the other question I have is regarding the stadium differential, and I've been questioning this ever <coughs> since it was introduced. Um, the justification for the stadium differential is something that has always eluded me. Um, to me, I can only see it as uh, uh, yet another different way of providing a subsidy for the stadium. Is there any uh, justification for having such a vastly different rate for the stadium? It is a commercial operation after all. Well, Councillor, as Mr Logie has said, the rating differentials are decisions of council. And so that's for council to consider what it wants those differentials to be and where they want to apply them. And the mechanism by which we might actually reconsider some of these differentials rather than just sit with these historical um, mechanisms would be what? Well, again, I'll refer back to what Mr Logie said earlier. The place where these are traditionally looked at as, as part of the LTP when we review everything in the round and that would be where a differential discussion and a review of those would be best placed. So the next long term plan meetings then? The, the, so yes, in the long term plan that is just about to kick off. Thank you. Councillor Gilbert. Thank you. Uh, sort of asked and answered, I just want to make it abundantly clear to those listening and perhaps to the media. So the DCC does not set the valuations on which the ratings are done, correct? So just so we're clear, Quotable Value, who is our contractor, don't they do the valuations? It is subject to audit. Excellent. And if somebody wants to, they can object to the valuation? Correct. If they go to the website, I think the rating information tag is on the front page and they can click on that and it'll take them through the process. Awesome. And just to be 100%, uh, qv.co.nz under the services tab would possibly be the right place to look? Correct. Thank you. That's all. Councillor Ackland. Thank you, Mr Beer. 
Um, this is probably a question for the CEO. Um, just going further on from Councillor Vandervis's uh, inquiry in relation to, you know, what sort of process can there be, or how can we work out a better way to, shall we say, investigate and uh, justify the the actual differentials. Um, uh, yonks ago there used to be such a thing as a, a rates working party and obviously the, the working party structure is not really uh, the done thing now but I asked the, the chief executive that you know closer to well as this next year unfolds and we are getting uh, toward the um, uh, the LTP discussions is there a way that a group of councillors and staff can actually delve deep into how the differentials are, are, are structured at the moment and what sort of changes uh, could potentially be made and why and what the impacts would be that uh, could be brought to council for um, you know, um, informed discussion. As I said, if council were interested in reviewing the rating method, then um, a direction in that regard, we'll see staff prepare a report that would come back to the um, relevant committee for detailed discussion and part of that is likely to involve a workshop process as well. Deputy Mayor Barker. I just have a concern following, not a concern, a question around the number of business units in um, Dunedin and I think I, if it's possible through the chair to ask um, the director of Enterprise Dunedin, we get a regional economic profile, maybe you might need a minute to look it up and I see that the I'm going to ask this as a question. The growth in business units in the last year, is it correct that it's been a growth, oh gosh, I just did it on my calculator, of 4.5% in the last year? Um, I'm unsure, Deputy Mayor, but I can confirm that and have a look at it for you and circulate that later. So are you aware of any business flight from Dunedin, given the statistics don't show it? Um, I'm not aware of any. Councillor Wiley. Um, Mr Logie, I guess when we look at the commercial rates um, and all the makeup of the... Um, the rating values. At the end of the day, it's about actually what's been seen in the past as most fair and equitable system to get to the, the funds that Council needs. Well, again, the rating method reflects decisions of previous Council. Thank you. And a question that I've asked previously uh, at Council uh, at, in this process is that the commercial rate is comes off as a business expense correct where the residential rate is actually paid by the the individuals or the ratepayers of Dunedin after they've paid their taxes and they can't claim back any funds on that basis like a business can. Is, is that correct? Correct. Mr Mayor, might I just clarify one thing? Sure. So I've just... Um, Clarified with Ms. Bodek the um, whether a resolution would be required to um, review the rating method, and um, she's advised me that as part of the ten-year plan process, we'll be looking at that anyway. And so, just to let councillors know, that they can expect that we will be doing that. So we don't require a specific resolution. How are we going with questions? We appear to be done. Thank you very much. Now, the motion, would someone like to uh, approve the motion? Councillor Ackland, do we have a seconder? Councillor Mayhem? So would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yeah, obviously, what we're doing here today, which 
what we're supposed to be doing here today is just getting this through so that it can go out for consultation and be discussed in May. Um, and of course a lot of our discussions so far have not been that, it's been a lot of other things. Uh, but with this particular one, uh, there's nothing different that we can do right now, but I do flag that I think that the differential really does need to be uh, discussed uh, at greater length and reconsidered. Um, I also think that there, um, you know, the comparisons from uh, other, other centres uh, is very important for us all to be aware of just what where, where, where they sit. Uh, and then the other thing too is, you know, other than differential, there's other ways that we could be considering uh, how, how our uh, rating method actually works. And uh, I'd certainly like to see uh, an opportunity sooner rather than later, uh, as the Chief Executive suggested before, that there could be workshops or, or, or whatever on this, so as that uh, you know, we're able to really delve into just uh, you know, what is the more uh, fair and equitable way of doing it. I remember a councillor many years ago saying that you can't have both, it's fair or equitable. Now, whether that's true or not, it's probably a, a personal opinion. Uh, nonetheless, I do think that this is something that we do need to uh, drill deep uh, into uh, to, to, to get um, what we could best say would be the, the, the fairest uh, split uh, in, the, in the rates take. Um, so I look forward to uh, those uh, opportunities in the near future. Thank you. Councillor Vanderbys. As I noted in yesterday's meeting, rating is invariably a blunt instrument and uh, it's very difficult to have a policy covering so many different categories that's going to really do justice to everybody. Um, however, we have uh, for many years now indulged a very significant differential uh, penalising commerce in Dunedin and that uh, very significant differential, I have never heard of a justification for it that actually makes any sense um, for the greater well-being of the city. Um, similarly, the uh, stadium differential, uh, I've never heard a justification for it other than um, uh, someone at some point felt that it was uh, just a, a good way of somehow propping up the stadium in another way or making it look less like it was losing money. Um, if we are going to have these very significant differentials, I think we need to at least have a workshop on how they are justified. And I think we need to be able to justify them publicly. Uh, I don't see that they can be. And because of that, I have uh, consistently voted against um, the rating method because of the very significant differentials uh, that are involved, in particular the commercial and the stadium one. So for that reason, I will again be voting against um, approving these recommendations. Deputy Mayor Barker. I'll support these and I also support looking at our, at our rating methods. It's always a good idea to look at these things because we just talked about waste minimisation and the fact that we need to look at some of that again. I just want to um, address the business flight from Dunedin comment because I think that's a really serious comment to make and, and contributes to people's perception of Dunedin. We've um, got a thriving business scene. We've, as I, I asked a question about the statistics, and in the last year that we measured to 2022 with the regional economic profile done by Infometrics, there were 549 more businesses, 4.5% growth in the last year. And we've had 10 years of positive growth in the number of business units. So I just want to clear that up so that no one's thinking that Dunedin is going backwards. We also have done a lot of work with our economic development strategy and we've had the, the growth 10,000 jobs in 10 years, etc. So I just want to put that to bed. It's not necessarily on the rating method, but it is about um, the commercial reality of doing business in the city.
Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I want to follow up on Councillor Barker's comments as well. Um, <clears throat> if we had business flight, then you wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing on Dukes Road and Mosgill right now in, in the industrial land area where there is new buildings going up every day. And in fact, we're running at the point now where we're starting to run out of industrial land, which again is very inconsistent with the idea that businesses are leaving in what has been described as flight. The other thing to remember is that if we move that differential down, we are moving it back to the residential. So reduction in commercial is an increase in residential. Just remember that when we go into this. I agree. Let's look at it again. My suspicion is that we won't change it very much because there was a reason that got set of those differentials. But don't think that by taking the commercial down, we don't have to move it somewhere else because our rate is based on the intake the council takes and then how we distribute it, where we take it from. And so reduction in commercial moves probably to residential. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you. I'll just be very brief. I wasn't going to speak. But I just want to also back up the comments of the previous two speakers um, and talk a little bit from experience. I've got a bunch of friends looking to open businesses in Dunedin, and the struggle is actually finding places. So that flies in, flies in the face of the comments of, of, of uh, a particular councillor. And I just don't think hyperbolic statements not based on fact are, are helpful at all. Uh, <coughs> Point of order. Councillor Walker is making defensive and derogatory uh, remarks about my speech which are untrue and offensive. Standing order. Standing order. Number. Take your pick. So. I think uh, when we um, start using the adjectives like hyperbolic and you know, personalising the comments. I think we just need to stick to the topic and um, without getting into personalised adjectives. So I'll uh, uphold the point of order and I think we should just stick to the topic that's under debate, please. Thank you. And stick to the topic rather than uh, characterise, um, you know, bringing in um, adjectives that then um, uh, colour up the descriptions of the, uh, the person and personalise the debate. Thank you. Please carry on, Mr. Walker. I'd actually finished, but I'll just close by uh, making one more comment that hopefully is not too controversial, um, and that's a uh, happy birthday to Councillor Benson Pope. Very good. Uh, here, here to that. Happy birthday. And uh, Councillor Gary. I was not going to speak, but I feel moved as Deputy Chair of Economic Development. Words matter, and it's really important that we don't throw statements around that are not accurate. And thank you, Councillor Barker, for those figures uh, and, and for the examples given. Uh, that is certainly my experience uh, of the business world and people being attracted here to do business. Uh, and starting up businesses and moving to Dunedin. Um, so I think we, words matter is, is the point I want to make and ask colleagues to be careful about that because then it is reported in the media, it's a great soundbite, but it isn't accurate uh, and that's been backed up by facts. Uh, very good. So uh, have we exhausted debate? So uh, the motion was uh, moved by Councillor Acklin. So at this stage, I'll put the motion to... Right of reply. Sorry? Right of reply. Right of reply, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, there's not much to reply to, really, because most people didn't actually speak to the, the motion. Uh, they were throwing in other things to suit themselves. Uh, but I will respond to uh, a couple of comments that Councillor Vandivis made. Um, and that the first one was that the, the rating method is a blunt instrument. We all know that. And, and we've got no other way to do it. And, and we just have to bite the bullet on that, accept that it's blunt, but also make sure that we can justify what we're doing with it and how, the, how we set the, 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 uh, the differentials and in, in, in any other part of the... Uh, the rating system, i.e. targeted rates and so on. Um, the, 
you know, the business flight comments, um, we don't have that information here right now and really it's not part of this. Um, and I suppose, as I say, there's not much else I can comment on because nobody really spoke to it. Uh, the key thing that I'd be saying is that uh, we need to look um, uh, very, very closely uh, into how this is managed uh, for the next LTP. Thank you. Very good. Uh, the motion is on the screen in front of you. I'll now put the motion by division. Councillor Ackland. Aye. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Gary. Aye. Councillor Gilbert. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lucas. Aye. Councillor Mayhem. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Weatherall. Yes. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Mayor Raddick. Aye. Carried 14-1. Very good. Moving along to item 21. The Revenue Compliance Report. We have Ms Bodecker and Mr Logie in the chair. So uh, do you have any comments on the report? Happy to take it as read. Do we have questions? We have no questions. Do we have a mover for the report? Thank you. We, Deputy Mayor Barker, do we have a seconder? Councillor Gilbert, would you like to speak to it? Thank you for this report and the revenue policy compliance. I um, looked at this with interest and also read all of the notes and a lot of them are based around what's happened on COVID, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the, um, the change in the policy are well warranted for this round and we we'll look forward to hopefully uh, beefing up some of the income from our, our visitor attractions um, as the international and international markets come back. Excellent speakers, anyone else? Councillor Vandervis. I just wanted to compliment staff on having a very clear table set out uh, with variances and notes where the variance was not within the plus or minus five percent um, made it very clear and easy for me to read and uh, appreciate that a lot of information there uh, concisely uh, portrayed thank you councillor walker Yep, just again echoing previous speakers thanking staff, but also just uh, obviously being aware that the two, the two, I guess, standout issues of the pools and the community housing, which of course would kick off the, or have relevance for our significance engagement policy. So look forward to those conversations um, next year as part of the LTP. Any, no other comments? Therefore, I'll put the motion that we note uh, the report. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Carried. And to item 22, the final item for today. Engagement on the annual plan. Uh, do we have Ms Bodega and Mr West? You can hear yeah. And we do have questions. So. <coughs> so, uh, Councillor Walker, you have a question. Um, yep, thank you. Uh, thanks for the report. Um, uh, just um, just a question around what happened last year. I mean, most of the feedback seemed to suggest it was fairly successful. Is that, is that your general view and sentiments from, from the processes that were run? Uh, I would say that was fair comment. Yeah, we got a good response to um, 
uh, on, particularly on social media to the videos we produced, which is what we're obviously proposing for part of this year's engagement. So. And um, in terms of uh, just some of the stuff that's happened the last couple of days, talking about um, trying to, to, I guess, get a, a foot in with some of our younger generation, does the council have a, a, a presence at all on either TikTok or YouTube? Y yes, on YouTube, no on TikTok. Um, and, Mr. I just, I'm happy to um, move the recommendation. Are there any other questions? No. Thank you very much. So, uh, Councillor Walker has indicated he would like to move the resolution, seconded Councillor Houlihan. Would you like to speak to him? Yeah, I will briefly. Um, just yeah, <clears throat> again, thanks to the staff um, for, 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 for last year's process and to the staff who will be involved in putting together um, this, this process as well. And I think as staff, hence my question, um, ha have pointed out last year was really successful. I thought it was excellent. Actually, it was a chance to, to highlight what we're doing um, well or badly in terms of our LTP uh, projects and uh, other other council decisions. I thought the multimedia approach was was excellent, actually. I think it's important to remember that we should do it traditionally, but also get into those those new forms of, 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 of getting the message out. And I wasn't actually joking about TikTok and YouTube. Um, probably, I don't know how many of you are aware, they're now the two most popular forms of social media by a long way amongst uh, amongst our youth and that and youth goes up to 25 so that's quite a big demographic for us to try and hit so let's not forget forget that particular forum and i think it was uh, correct me if i'm wrong councillor wiley but it was you yesterday who i think quite rightly pointed out that we should really encourage as many people to come and sit here and tell us face to face what they think is is not right with the city but equally i, I also encourage people to come and tell us what's going what's going well. Um, it's it's of, often uncomfortable when we sit here being berated, but it's also nice when somebody comes in and says something that's nice and pats us on the back. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I said yesterday, I don't, and I think this is true, I, a lot of what we're doing here will be around the rates increase, but I still firmly believe, and I don't know how we tell the story well, that most people um, including my peer group, who I consider a pretty smart bunch, are not cognizant of what we do and what they get when they pay their rates. So I think, and I think we did do it quite well last year, particularly in the, in, in some of the, um, the sort of the, the online movie-ish stuff. But I think really just reminding people of the very, very, very long list. And as I've said, when I tell people. Um, boringly what we do, that list goes on and on and on and on. So that would be one of the things I'd urge that we do do is just reminding people that, uh, yep, nothing, it's, n it's never nice when, a pri when the cost of anything goes up, but just a reminder of how great the value is at the moment. Thank you. Deputy B. Barker. I want to commend us going out and doing the engagement. It says in the report that we don't need to do it, but we look at our, our ROS statistics, which talks about, oh gosh, is that 31 or 3 31 percent of people happy with the amount of public consultation undertaken. And the top of the um, improvement we would like to see this year, number one, more consultation on projects, listen to the public, and I think that going out and doing this engagement in a positive way is really, really important. So I look forward to, to people engaging with us. I think we've exhausted comment. So, uh, uh, Councillor Walker, I'll put the motion now. You ready? So, all those in favour, say aye. aye. Against? Carried. So, uh, there endeth the day, and there endeth the annual, annual plan um, for this year. Thank you very much for your participation. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. the draft annual plan, yeah. yes. So lunch is supplied or not today? No, no lunch is not supplied today. It'll be, it'll be very early. It's only 11.30, so 
we've done well in avoiding lunch. So, <laughs> see you later.